to fix a machine, you, the, the machine's not going to fix itself. It, it is going, you need to go in there and find the exact thing that's wrong and fix it. But the body's not a machine. It's an organic self-organizing thing. If you give it the right sunlight and the right food and the right rest, it will heal itself. It will figure things out itself, but you kind of have to live the generally healthy, positive lifestyle. Keep moving. I mean, you're no stranger to a podcast, are you? You've done a you've done a fair few. I've uh, done a fair so, few. <laughs> so you must love them, right? <laughs> yeah, they're fun. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You don't know who you're just accepting that uh, Zoom request to, and then some random appears on the screen. You're like, oh, <laughs> let's that. talk. Um, it's always like a window into another world, isn't it? So yeah, a bit about what I'd love to talk to you about because, as I said, you got a hell of a lot of podcasts out there, kind of explaining and going into large detail about what you do so perhaps you go in a kind of a similar but different direction um because what i would love to delve into is is to talk to people it is it's in the core of what you do which is the same idea of me and the same passion as mine is to help people feel and move better but we're talking to i mean health in general and how movement coincides and is conducive to health so how we can almost allow people to understand on a real simple level how they can feel better through movement practices, through, you know, uh, ach achieving and attaining a movement practice. So kind of that, but also just in general, um, how we can, you know, give people more of an insight into you know, how they can feel better through um, embodying like the experience of a movement practice, which is very different from a structured, which has its benefits, of course, but a structured, very regimented, you know, someone telling you what to do. Yeah. Uh, class. So, so kind of in that kind of realm, but then, I mean, I've got a bunch of things I love to talk to you about, obviously play and why that's so, um, you know, important to, I know you don't like the word, but it's obviously, <laughs> it's there. Um, hey, it's, it, it's the title of my book. I can't, I can't, uh, <laughs> can't not like it. You can redefine it if you want. <laughs> um, and then I'd like to just maybe initially talk about movement and flexibility, because I think that's a bit of a myth. It certainly was for me. And you kind of dispelled that one. I, I mean, I've got your book, Guide to Better Movement, right here for everyone who's watching. Um, and you've also got um, Playing with Movement as your, your the, the second book more recent um but yeah the, the mobility and flexibility because i i really started to um tune into my body and gain more awareness of you know of of of, of movement just in general and how to uh cultivate different practices different kind of mobility exercises to help me feel ultimately better um, I remember just being on dance floors in, in university and just feeling so good within my body because of my yoga practice and how much that was doing for me more than working my biceps and my chest was what I was doing right. when I was like 17, 18 years old. So the, the yoga for me, which was, you know, near enough seven years ago, started to get into my body, tune in, feel, and then that ended up going, going less so physical and more so mental and, you know, as it as it is um but yeah um so so i can't remember the question that i was going to ask but but kind of along those lines of how people can kind of you know i think in the monday we, we we've definitely kind of disconnected our bodies <laughs> we're kind of walking around in them but not necessarily feeling and i think it's one of the most the, 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 the most powerful things you can do. It's one of the principles, the pillars of health. It is movement um, and movement for movement's sake as well. Uh, not doing it to look good or doing it for some kind of, you know, um, extrinsic reward. Um, right, so right. The movement for, for kind of general health uh, and how people can, yeah, cultivate a practice or cultivate different ways of moving, which all really help them just be well in, in a world which is quite toxic at times and quite uh, lacking relationships with the ground, lacking relationships with um, different ways of moving, 
more primal ways of moving, which is what I've definitely got into now, less so the yoga, more so the natural movement side of things, uh, hanging, squatting, rolling, you know. I love it. That's my, that's my next book. Oh, amazing. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what you're just talking about reminds me of this phrase that I like that I read. I thought it sounded good was that we're in danger of becoming, uh, uh, what is it, uh, bodiless minds and mindless souls. No, that's not it. No, it's uh, bodiless souls and soulless, uh, soulless bodies <laughs> and uh, bodiless souls. So, I mean, you, when you yeah, think yeah. about anything related to, you know, what's going on in your conscious mind, it's really kind of hard to conceive of what that has to do with your body. It feels like this ethereal, abstract realm. And when you're working on your body, you kind of sometimes treat yourself like a robot or a piece of meat. You know, I've got to stretch this piece of meat or I've got to make this uh, muscle larger, but it's all connected. And that's kind of what the whole mind body thing is about to me is connecting those things together because, you know, cognitively, we always want to keep them separate. And it's really easy when you're staring into computer screens and we're becoming, we're living in this kind of abstract, ethereal, realm but it's all supported by you know the physical stuff and you got to put those things together you got to remind yourself even if you have a mind body practice you know you need to remind yourself you do where you've come from and what is more uh, what where your body would have spent the most amount of time <laughs> i almost think like there's that amazing albert einstein quote is you can't solve the same the, the problem on the same level it was created so we're living in our heads and that's been created for, you know, for, for in, in systems in a systemic way. But then solving that with the mind is it's just not going to happen. So we need to drop into the heart and understand what we really want or where we've really come from. But I sometimes do think, then I go back to, well, we do need to kind of intellectualize these things to make sense to us, to then do them. Like, I almost feel like we need to study history to know like the mistakes we made or um, to know what not to do. Or for me, it was about learning about the human evolution process and where we spent, you know, most of our, um, of our time as a, as a species. And, and that, that quote, that's like, if the entire human history was a book, it would be 300 pages. The last page would be on agriculture. The last sentence would be on the modern day. And like the last word would be like technology or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be, uh, it would be like late December in the year before humans even show up. Yeah. And then, and then you know, iPhones is like the last half of a second or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? It's mad. Um, so yeah, but I, I guess we do, we need to, we need to, kind of intellectualize these things and, and, and figure out where we've been, where our body spent most of the time, because it's not the template in which we're living and which we're born into and which was, we're educated into isn't necessarily, um, you know, it's necessarily relevant for what our bodies are actually more designed to do or to be around to, to you know, the food we eat or the way we move, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to, you know, I live in my head quite a bit. I like to do a, a lot of thinking, you know, that's kind of one, one road into your whole, the whole thing. But then the other road in is uh, the one that I was kind of neglecting for a while was just kind of the movement, the visceral way to do things. Like uh, a guy that I like, Moshe Feldenkrais, I do some uh, Feldenkrais method stuff. He says that, you know, everything about us is basically thinking, feeling, moving, or acting. And every one of those is like a road into your system. You can kind of develop yourself by doing, you know, talk therapy. Uh, but he's kind of like every every uh, thought, everything we say is connected in some way to the way we're sensing our body and the way we're moving our body. So another road in is movement therapy. Mm -hmm. So he just kind of developed a uh, a brand of movement therapy, which is about all gentle, mindful movements. And the idea was, you know, part of it was to have better movement, but part of it was to be like a better person and develop yourself. So all these things are connected and you can kind of jump in and start connecting to everything else by going in through different pathways and his is the movement and perception pathway mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely um i think one of the amazing things that i heard first from rave kelly who i've been following for some time huh. i heard him talk i think i've got a rave kelly look going on at the moment with my rugged you, you need more you need more <laughs> more more tree in my beard or some branches hanging out. <laughs> you put some branches in there 
Um, yeah, he, him talking about this, the complex, and you, you talked about it a lot, of course, but I think it's really important for people to kind of, to, to, to get that, the complex versus the complicated. And for me, I remember when I, I heard about it, and I was like, wow, that's really kind of like lifted a weight off my shoulders for some reason. I, I don't know why, it was, it was like, I was walking down the street and I was like, well, it's not complicated, it's just complex. And it kind of like, it, it kind of like allowed me to just lean into it that little bit more, well, whatever it is. And if we're talking about the body, it's not that it's complicated and I need to, you know, felt, felt like I, I needed to get it and study. And it's just a complex system that, that really needs time and, and, and understanding of. Yeah, it's a. I I I I know what you mean. Just to just for the listeners, the the difference between complex and complicated, we kind of use those terms interchangeably. But people who study complex systems say there's there's kind of a big difference here. A complicated system is something like a rocket ship or a DVD player or a, a toaster or something like that. And all of the different uh, you need to be an expert to be able to to create one of those things or organize one of those things or fix a problem. With, with, a, with a rocket ship or a computer program. And if you're an expert, you can achieve incredible things in controlling those systems. Uh, but with a complex system, expertise doesn't help you as much because everything that's going on, you can't really ever measure every variable that's important and how they interact, kind of like the human body. I mean, how many variables control what's going on with our human body? But it's a self-organizing uh, system. All of the order in the system just kind of comes from the system being in the right environment. So like, consider the difference between trying to send a rocket ship to the moon and raise a healthy toddler. The healthy toddler is, is, is a, raising that toddler is a complex problem. If you're an expert, you might do a little bit better job in, in raising a toddler, but most of it's just kind of common sense. And just like an everyday ordinary mom who provides a good loving environment and gives toddlers what they need, that toddler is just going to be just as healthy as if you, you know, use all of the expertise in the world to, to raise it. But a rocket ship, you have to be a world-class scientist to build one or else things will fail miserably. And I think we get confused about that with our bodies. You know, you, people kind of start to overthink it and think like this is rocket science, but it's not. It's more like, you know, ra raising up plants in a garden or, or a toddler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You generally have to step back from it to gain a bigger perspective of what, what the actual thing is trying to tell you or, you know, like focusing in on it is not going to help like tuning right into some really fine detail. You really need to have a bigger perspective of this thing as a whole. Zoom, and zoom you out. Do. Yeah. You zoom yeah, maybe. out and you see it, don't you? You see it all. But as yeah, a scientist. Like you said, with the zooming out like hundreds of millions of years in evolution. That That's a good perspective to get. Yeah. Well, too. Absolutely. And I think that's what meditation does for you. Just, just, just on that point. I, I think I remember the first time I was, I was, I guess I was explaining it to someone to try and kind of give them an insight into the experience that I was having. It was like, it was almost like I've zoomed myself out of, of me and I was giving, I was allowed to just view, say my issues, my problems, my thoughts, my emotions, just some distance. And they just, they just look different. You know, they just, they seem different, but yeah. Yeah. And we, and we all know this stereotype of like the real science scientist who's, you know, very intelligent at this one thing and themselves, they, they're almost disembodied. They're, they're, they've spent so much time focusing on this one thing that they've kind of lost touch of, of, of everything else at, at the same time. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you keep looking at things under the microscope, you can miss the big picture. I mean, it's a very hard thing to like, understand something very up close and then figure out how that fits into the big picture and to kind of like toggle back between the close-up view and the faraway view. It's very easy to get lost in translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, as a, a, in the medical system, one, uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day and it, and they were talking about if you teach people the wrong thing, they'll get really good at teaching the wrong thing. <laughs> Which yeah. perhaps on some level, which we've kind of done, haven't we? We've a reductionist approach, kind of like along the lines of what we're talking about, and and everyone's got really good at teaching the wrong, perhaps the wrong approach or the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, that reductionist approach where you're kind of like, well, I mean, if you want to become an expert in, 
you know, the way the liver works or where the endocrine system yes. works. You have to you have to put that whole thing under a microscope and it takes years and years and years and years to put that together. And you don't have that much time to to also study how those systems interact with the other systems in the body. And it might be the way things are interacting that's more important than what's going on in any one area. So mm. it's not easy to put it all together. Yeah, I saw, I saw that you're on Perry Nicholson's podcast at some point. I'm sure you're good friends with him. But he, he's been on uh, it's Stop Chasing Pain as is obviously over over overhang in that arch. And it's brilliant because that's it, that is what we do. We just oh, fix the pain there. Oh, you see pain here, go fix it. And you just start chasing it. And it's an amazing. Oh, yeah. That's his exact analogy, isn't it? Yeah. 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 We just you just chase it wherever it is when really, you know, that pain can be related to something which is, you know, totally separate from the thing that is causing pain. Um, and on the subject of pain, which I think uh, obviously it's kind of like the, 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 the premise for your book, really, isn't it? The, the neurocentric kind of brain pain perspective, which you which you call it. Um, do you think that was, do you think it got so much, because it is a successful book, it's, it's, you know, everyone in the movement world knows of it and, and you've done, you did really well going from being an attorney to then releasing this book and spending so much time. Like, I, I think it's brilliant. It is. It's brilliant. I think one of the main reasons is that you're, you're an amazing communicator, whether that's written, talking, oh, thank you. I think you articulate yourself well on your points and they're very much like, you know, you, you're not all in with the science and you're not all in with the holistic it's it's very much like a, a combination a yin and a yang of the two and i think i think it's brilliant um so yeah perhaps perhaps the, the question i was going to ask was do you think uh research and knowledge was lacking about pain or like how we relate to pain how it in pain interrelate interrelates with other parts of the body because because you taking that kind of lens through at movement do you think it was it's kind of like you know one of the first books to kind of do that i think well i mean i'm sure sure it's there's there's not new ideas in the book i, I mean i'm, I'm sure I, I brought some some old ideas to to new people that's that's kind of the idea but i you know i didn't invent anything but um you know the main idea of the book is you know we have this assumption you know if it if it hurts in a particular area the problem is in that particular area but it's not necessarily true it could be that the problem is enhanced sensitivity to what's going on in that area and that could be happening because of inflammation right where it hurts let's say it's your knee it could be happening because of stuff that's going on in your spinal cord it could even be because of uh the way your brain is reading the signals from those areas and it, there's miscommunications and so that's kind of the, the complexity of pain that's why lots of things matter for pain that's why you know not getting a good night's sleep might be the variable that that means that causes your back to hurt and not hurt or what you're eating or something that's going on in your relationship or something that's moving in another joint i mean it's a uh, but when you go to the doc they very often put a microscope on the exact area that hurts and they're looking for the explanation there and they're directing all their treatment there uh and you know that's why if you've got a, a pain problem, you can go to five different providers, get five different explanations for why it hurts, five different treatments. It's very confusing for people. Yeah, I think one of the worst, and I heard it the other day, was I'll have some rest and then take some ibuprofen and, and you'll be fine. <laughs> and often rest is important, of course, like when you're tackling any problem, you need rest, you need recovery. Um, but in terms of strength and strengthening muscles and 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 you're working on your mobility um what would you say to kind of that opinion about something in particular perhaps the foot you've got some you know tendonitis or or something in the foot and then you're prescribed to rest it and take some painkillers yeah well that's st that's step one anytime something hurts that's probably the first thing to do I mean, when something hurts you know uh you know and you give rest a chance however it is i mean if you get in a if you break a bone, you're going to have to rest that for, for quite a while. If you've got a little muscle strain, a little bit less and figuring out how much to rest is maybe not the easiest thing, but it's the first thing you do. But when that's not working, you have to do something else. And that might be mobilizing the area that might be strengthening the area um, that might be doing mind body stuff. If maybe the problem lives a little bit more north of wherever you're hurting, mm, yeah. uh, coordinating the area. 
Yeah, those are kind of, there's, there's five or six kind of general things that I think of that might help with pain. Now, some pains are more simple. If you've got a, if you've got a, a you know, a sliver in your foot, the, the, the problem is the sliver and you just take it out. It's, it's kind of a simple pain problem. But a lot of pain problems are more complex. It's multifactorial. We don't know exactly why it's hurting. Low back pain is like that a lot. When people have low back pain, um, it can often be very, very hard to figure out the one single factor that's causing that. And we know that many different factors uh, might help with the pain. So like when people have low back pain, there's lots of different therapies that work on average, like strengthening the area tends to be helpful and mobilizing the area tends to be helpful. Just walking and getting out and doing aerobic exercise can be helpful. Doing like meditation could be helpful. Lots of different ways to like generally be healthy uh, is helpful. And it's, it's pretty hard to find the one thing that we know is going to knock it out of the park, which is why I like people to just like try lots of different things. And all of these things like make you more generally healthy and functional anyway. So they're, they're kind of good things to do anyway. And, th and they might help with your pain too. Yeah. It's like when someone goes, um, changes the diet and perhaps they, they cut out meat, they're probably doing a hell of a lot of other things because, because they've reached that, you know, general generalizing, but they reached that point and they've changed a lot in their life as well. Maybe they've stopped seeing some friends that didn't serve them, or perhaps they stopped going, they started going to yoga as well as becoming a vegan. And it's like, oh, it's the vegan thing. Well, actually lots of things in this, in this situation you've changed. So the reason you're feeling good might be a myriad of things. And it's similar to when you feel pain. It's like, oh God, I better stop drinking now. I better focus on the pain. I better, um, is in focus on recovery, focus on this. And you generally start to look after your body as a whole, don't you? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the whole idea of pain. It's a signal that something's gone wrong and you got to do something. But yeah. <laughs> what yeah. exactly yeah. needs to be done is not always that obvious. Uh -huh. Yeah, very true. Um, there was something I wanted to touch on there. It's, it's gone over my head. Um, well, I, well I, could, I could expand on what I said. That's kind of what, yeah, yeah. why I like the idea of uh, exploration and motivation to explore and curiosity about what your body works. I mean, in my opinion, a lot of pains, you're going to have to do some trial and error. You're going to have to do some experimentation. You're going to have to do some exploration. Some of that might involve a little risk. So kind of like developing the curiosity and the motivation to try different things, I think is a healthy thing versus versus kind of like being very fearful and you know putting yourself in a box and like you say rest rest is a good idea but getting the idea that you shouldn't move anymore or you should stop being active and you're going to hurt yourself that might be good in the short term in the long term it's part of a behavior that's going to limit you especially over time yeah yeah and how are you resting as well i think how are you resting are you spending all day in bed are you you know, lazy, lazy back on the couch with, with kind of, <laughs> you know, causing yourself other issues. How, how are you doing this and what are you feeding yourself in this period of rest? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Are you out what, taking a nice walk at, outside and doing yeah. some restorative yoga or are you just lying on the couch? There's some different <laughs> kinds of rest. Watching some, yeah, media. Um, so <laughs> back pain, why back pain? Cause I think it's the, the number one, I think even in the UK, it's the number one cause of illness sickness off work why back pain in our modern day why, why so so uh why do we have back oh, yeah, the, well, why is it so billion prevalent? dollar there's a jillion dollar question um <laughs> you know i you know what a, an evolutionary perspective that's kind of one way to look at it you know some some people uh will say that well you know we spent hundreds of millions of years with our spines horizontal with four points of support walking around on four legs and then yeah humans stood up and and we got all these advantages by getting our hands free we could use tools we could we could walk around but maybe the price we paid is a back that's inherently a little bit predisposed to s some damage there and that's that's one way of looking at it. i think that's not that optimistic <laughs> but there does seem to be there does seem to be something about backs uh that hurt more than other parts of the body i mean people don't complain about their fronts as much as they, they complain about their backs um but i think maybe the more optimistic way to look at it is, is that most back pain tends to go away uh after you know a couple weeks uh and, and keeping active is is uh, usually the the best way to deal with deal with it 
you do, I don't think you should think of back pain as something that you have to fix or that you have to solve, or there's one magic thing that's going to help it. Mm. Uh, I, th that's kind of like the rocket science approach where you're like to fix a machine, you, the, the machine's not going to fix itself. It, it is going, you need to go in there and find the exact thing that's wrong and fix it. But the body's not a machine. It's an organic self-organizing thing. If you give it the right sunlight and the right food and the right rest, it will heal itself. It will figure things out itself, but you kind of have to live the generally healthy, positive lifestyle. Keep moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's optimistic. Um, could be something to do with the last, what, 50, 100 years. We've, we've grown quite a lot as well. So maybe we just need to raise, raise the work surfaces that we're working from <laughs> or get down on the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing good that comes from doing this all day long. That's, that's for sure. No, no. Gravity is working against you there. Yeah, awesome. Um, so uh, about the mobility and flexibility then, could you, could you kind of just go over those just very briefly? Because I think it, yeah. was, impo it was important for me to, yeah, to, to understand and you say, I think it was coming from you, you said flexibility is overrated. And I would certainly agree. It looks good though, doesn't it? It looks good in the mirror. And it, when you can, you know, perform the splits, it's uh, it's very, uh, it's a party trick. And uh, I'd love to, to do the splits. Probably not going to enhance much of my life apart from looking good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think flexibility got a little bit overrated uh, because of, you know, yoga classes and Jean-Claude Van Damme movies and, and stuff like that. Uh, but, um, I mean, there's, there's definitely something very important there. Range of motion, having good range of motion at your joints is one of the basic elements of fitness. You know, you've got strength, you've got conditioning, you've got your range of motion. You need to have a uh, full range of motion, but the question is how much is enough? Uh, I was kind of surprised to learn, uh, when I, when I first started studying this, that, you know, for example, athletic coaches that are trying to figure out how much is enough for their athlete, they're kind of happy when you can get your, you can kind of touch your toes. They don't need you to, to get your palms on the floor mm. or to, you know, have your nose to your knees for most athletic purposes. Some you do. I mean, if you want to be a diver, if, you know, there are, there are specific sports where there's specific ranges of motion you've got to hit, but for your kind of general health for you, like, you know, uh, like your football player, soccer player, basketball player, we're usually just kind of looking for normal ranges of motion which is a little different from mobility. So mobility, I just, a lot of people distinguish from flexibility. Flexibility is how far you can go, how far you can move at your joints. And mobility is more about how functional you are at your, at your end range of motion. So when you get to your end range of motion, let's say in your hips, can you move fast? Can you move with control? Can you move with variability? Uh, that's a different question from, from whether you can just get to the end range of motion. If you get to the end range of motion and have good flexibility, but you're moving slowly and without stability and without power and without variability, and it feels creaky and it doesn't feel good, you've got the flexibility, but not the mobility. So, so that means, so that kind of suggests when you're training your ranges of motion include some challenges such as going with variability, going with coordination, going with speed, make it part of a functional movement pattern instead of just these kind of boring static stretches where you're just trying to get there, which happen in a lot of static stretching programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think people look to yoga as like the ultimate physical practice, but, it, but it's, it's really not. It's really one part of a big system which it's a great it's a great practice but it's not the whole deal absolutely and it, if someone looking at it like it was um you know designed as a as a, as a physical practice well, well no it's definitely not that's not it <laughs> it's not saying that flexibility is the goal because to, to an onlooker you probably would think well everyone's clearly in that practice trying to get flexible that must be the goal um, cause everyone's going to these end range of motion and just hanging out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, would, I used to go to a lot of, uh, yoga classes and I, I still enjoy yoga, but I remember going in, uh, and you know, the teacher would say straight up, this is not about how far you go. This is not, uh, th this is a, a mind body practice. This is about a lot of things besides just 
getting into the splits or something like that. And I kind of knew that, but there was a, also another part of me that would watch the people that would go really far and be like, that's what I got to do. <laughs> That's what success looks like. So it's like, it would just like turn on the stupid part of my mind to be in there and watch the beautiful people do their beautiful moves. Kind of similar yeah. to going to a CrossFit class and being like, okay, I know I can't go in here and just go nuts <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, just like really go for it or else something bad's going to happen. But, you know, you put on Rage Against the Machine and, and people are working hard and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do how, how much do you think that's, the condition of being competitive? Well, I'm pretty competitive. I mean, not everyone is, is, is uh, that competitive, but I personally, that's a way that that's a risk factor for me that gets me dumb. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, but, you know, in a way it's great too. It causes me to show up. I've played, you know, a lot of competitive sports. It's kept me really active. So it's kind of like a, it's a benefit and, and it's a risk. So that's kind of like knowing yourself, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's that accountability to, you know, your CrossFit partner or the team you're in, or it's a social kind of social accountability and just showing up for the, the other people around you. When people are at the gym, they generally work harder than they do when they're at home. Unless absolutely sort of psychological problems going on in the yeah basement. yeah well that's that's another one of those big picture things i think and and, and one of those one of those uh ideas about being kind of like this bodiless mind i mean i think that we have this idea that the way we move and what we do is just all about what's going on inside of our head but it's also like what our head is inside of you know we we kind of don't often realize that we are going to conform to what's going on around us. You know, we're inherently social creatures. So if other people are moving in a certain way, we're going to want to start moving that way. That's going to be easier for us to move that way. It's going against the grain to not do what other people around you are doing. So, you know, find the right group for you. That's, that's really important. Yeah, that is. Yeah, absolutely. And being conscious of that. For sure. What are your thoughts about CrossFit then? I'd like to ask you about that because for me, it's a bit too intense. And I, I went for a, a good three month stint and I've always, it was someone that I always wanted to, you know, um, bring into my, my, my routine. And it was just too intense. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't not go hard and yeah. be okay with that. And it, I don't know, perhaps that's something internal, but also it was just, yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of like the the real atmosphere of like you, you, the, the, there's no not going hard, uh, and you yeah you know, three times a week. I, I think that it's a, it's a good example of uh, you know the value of community, the value of meaning, like the the value of a tribe. So I mean, just, just like I said, you go to one of those things and you're going to feel more motivated to work than you normally would because you're moving in sync with other people. There's music. There's like a, a common set of values. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you have, but if those movements aren't going to be healthy for you in the long term because they're too intense, that, that that's the downside of it. And so, if you're the kind of person that responds really well to that type of uh, workout, that's that's the the right place to be. Um, I think that a lot of CrossFit gyms have kind of like responded to some of the criticisms over it being, you know, kind of gung ho and mm -hmm. and make it. Uh, available and appropriate for more different types of people. And I, and, and I love the movements in, in CrossFit. I mean, basing it around squats and barbell movements. It's, it's a great set of movements. Yeah, absolutely. And the warm ups as well, where you just basically get on your hands and feet and crawl. And it's like, that doesn't exist in our day to day and we need more of it. Yeah. Yeah. Th there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh huh. Yeah. I did want to talk to you about arthritis because I believe that it's I mean, transitioning very quickly. But arthritis has been showing up. It feels like it's showing up more now. And I just did I did some research and it's it's like 10 million people it's affecting in our in our modern day and in England. It's like one in six people and 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 rheumatoid arthritis as well and what the difference is. And obviously it is inflammation. It's I think the rheumatoid arthritis is is also kind of like autoimmune. Uh, and and it's not necessarily i don't like the idea of like your body attacking itself which which you read some things on the nhs and it's like oh your cells are attacking you and it's well that's the wrong terminology it's probably really trying to help but just you know <laughs> deter um what's the word uh and the the um i don't know but yeah you know you know what i'm saying so yeah well there's an ex it's another example of like a, a miscommunication mm -hmm. that's going on somewhere in yes. the body 
you know, so, so someone is uh, not getting the right signals and, and, and things are not cooperating and not doing the right things. I don't know that much about arth our arthritis. I know that some arthritis is kind of a local problem that lives in the joint and there's local inflammation there and there's a breakdown of some of the, of the materials in there and things get rough and things get crappy and things get inflamed. And then there's the rheumatoid, which is more of a systemic, maybe autoimmune type of situation where you get inflammation. Yeah, there, there really are very big sources of pain and disability, and uh, we don't have great solutions to them yet. Mm -hmm. Yet. You're an optimistic character. I love it. <laughs> nice. So let's bring in play a little bit here. So this is yeah your second book. Uh, I've not read that, but um, yeah, I think it's it's on the list. And it plays a big play, plays a big part in uh, in my daily life. It's, it's always a... It's, all, it's kind of like the mission. It's not, you know, I don't think of it as a goal or a thing I have to do. It's it's kind of like the overarching mission of, you know, integrating this being as a child. Like we don't, we don't stop moving because we get old. We get old because we stop moving. Like that's also one of my favorite quotes. Like it, it, I, I spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, uh, in particular Cambodia. I spent six, six months, six months there. And just the the culture of very rural i was working at an orphanage and it was like teaching english at the orphanage anyway the the grandparents and the, and the family they just of course there's, they, there's no retirement age they just continue to move and they continue to you know um just work on the farm and it's amazing to see like going from the west in england how old people firstly are, are, are treated and i think that's a separate conversation but old people and, and how they move in these other cultures. I saw it in Vietnam. Yeah. I was, I was in Vietnam and one of my observations was, well, they all sit in deep squats all the time. So you, you go down the streets of Saigon and there's people eating their soup in a deep squat, fixing their motorcycle in a deep squat, you know, just hanging out in a deep squat. And they, these, you know, 80 year old women move up and down uh, effortlessly. Like, you know, if you watched, uh, uh, you know, your average 80 year old in, in the U S getting up and down from the floor, that's a slow creaky, uh, affair. Yeah. But quite different over there. Yeah. Full risk as well as you're not getting a full risk as much over there. Are you? Um, no, I, and, yeah, I, I suppose that would be better too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's one of the leading, um, causes or, or uh, decisions in old people going to homes because of the full risk or they're living at home or they can't sit down to go to the toilet on their own. And that's, that's, that's a serious thing. If someone can't perform that very normal function, I mean, the fact that you are sitting down on the toilet and not squatting could be a part of that. Um, not having a relationship with the ground, which I, you know, got rid of most of the furniture where I live. And oh yeah, that's that's done wonders for me i mean i've talked about it in other podcasts because i love talking to kind of movement specialists and stuff but yeah it's 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 just a it's just a it's one of the best things i've ever done for my my health just just honestly rolling around on the floor and that 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 in itself back to the question it kind of it coincides with play because we're often like just playing around on the floor and just rolling around and and bringing that back to the a normal way of being and yeah. not like if you're on the floor it's like well, what are you doing down there it's it's very like not the norm you know in our culture yeah it's but it it i think uh, in the larger sense it's abnormal you know you know uh you know most of the cultures that that have existed and and quite a few of the ones that exist right now they spend a lot of time in the ground, they, which means they're transitioning to and from the ground. Our, we we kind of tend to stop right when the thighs are getting close to parallel. So it's a way of avoiding any kind of a squat or a deep lunge all day long, every day, maybe for many days at a time. So then there's the, the getting up and down part of it. And then there's also the, you know, just sitting in a, in a position where you're kind of at the end range of your joints in, in the hips and the knees uh, if you sit cross-legged, if you sit kneeling, all these different ways of sitting on the floor, you know, you're kind of engaging in some, you know, maybe 10 to 20 minutes of static stretching in an area that uh, maybe needs to be stretched, you know, to, to know how to be a normal joint, especially like an Achilles tendon or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. There's like over a hundred different rest positions to, to sit on the ground. 
And um, Katie Bowman talks about that a lot in terms right. of, you know, bringing in things that are, you're doing your workout, you know, you're actually just reducing the time that you spend at the gym by playing around and working from the ground. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like a mini, it's like a mini, uh, yoga workout for your lower body. I mean, I, I think that if you, you know, spend time in the ground, you, you don't really need to do any mobility work for your lower body. Every joint gets a pretty good workout. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's what you need to live well. You wouldn't need to be able to move in those ranges of motion when you can. When you drop something on the floor, you're not like struggling as uh, as you get older. You're, you've been doing that all your life. So what you use, you use more. What you don't yeah. use, you lose. Don't use yeah. it. <laughs> I know. So, um, so play and how can people, I guess, start to feel the benefits of, play and you know doing it for doing its sake and perhaps i don't know any any along the years of experience and talking to people what the kind of best advice is for people to try and get yeah. that play back into their lives yeah well um uh, the book is basically kind of comparing what i call playing with movement to working with movement and so working with movement means doing your exercise in a way that's highly prescribed and structured and not really intrinsically motivated. So you're not doing the exercise because you love that exercise. You're doing it to gain some benefit in the future, like losing weight or looking good in a swimsuit or something like that. The, the exercises are kind of repetitive and not variable and, 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 and very structured. And playing with movement is kind of like the opposite. It's moving in a way that's where there's intrinsic motivation. In other words, you're doing the movement just for the sake of doing the movement, like the way people uh, play a lot of sports. They're, they might be doing the sport like for the health benefit, but they're doing it just because they love it. Or they're going for the hike just because they like to do that thing. A lot of people run just because they like running or lift weights just because they like lifting weights. So, so your attitude for doing something matters. And then the degree to which it's really prescribed. Are you doing the exercise in a way that's kind of like open-ended and flexible and you can make choices about how to do it and like different varieties of doing it. And you, and, and you can kind of tailor that to your mood and it feels exploratory and curious versus just looking at a piece of paper and going, okay, I've got four reps of this sets or, or something like that. Uh, that increases your motivation and your engagement and the creativity of the whole thing. And there's a lot of benefits to that. And, and I don't think working with movement is, is, is all that bad. It has its benefits. You know, it might, for some people, it might help them show up. It might help them structure things that need to be structured. Um, but we've kind of forgotten about the benefits of exercising in a way that is much, much more kind of natural, much more self-organizing and curious and, and fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you say um, working with movement, what exactly do you mean that? I mean, any kind of movement, I mean, you, you, anything that counts as, as physical activity um, can be like more or less playful. So, I mean, yes. you could go for a walk in a way that it's like a very uh, structured, I need to get my steps in, I'm going to count every one. The doctor said to do it, I'm doing it exactly this time, I don't like it. Or you could do it in a way that's kind of like you're enjoying the outdoors and it's something you really want to do and you may walk far and you may walk not so far. Uh, you may kind of discover things along the way and go window shopping. Those are two different ways to kind of do the same thing, but it might make a lot of difference for some people. And when I work with uh, clients who are in pain, I, I'm very interested not just in the way they move, but in how they want to move and the movements that are meaningful to them. Because I know those are the ones that are, they're, they're going to repeat and they're going to show up for, which is often the most important thing in exercise. And it's going to reduce stress and that's healthy too. And um, yeah. Yeah. Dance for me is. is Dance. Is yeah. 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 Powerful. I mean, for most people, but I mean, when you become like it, you can start working with dance when you get to that professional level and it can become like a bad, bad thing, highly repetitive, working through pain. It's not fun anymore. That's when it becomes unhealthy. Mm -hmm. But for most people, dance is, is the perfect example of a playful, intrinsically motivating variable wonderful thing to do 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is. It's it is that simple in a way. It's it's understanding what you like to do. Do you like to play badminton? Do you like to go out for a walk? Do you like to dance? What what what, what is it that you're interested in? And there yeah. will be there will be something, and obviously it has to be an activity moving your body. But yeah, go, and, and socializing with your friends as well, going on hikes and stuff. It's it's and it's, being outside, all those things. Yeah. Yeah, and and just playing with that, and yeah, not 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 having such a structure. Yeah, yeah and, not, and not worrying too much. We've been given a lot of well-intended advice from a lot of movement professionals, like physical therapists and doctors and trainers, that is very much directed at you know this is the right way to move and that's the wrong way to move. And you have when you do this, make sure that your knees don't get over your toes and you have the right posture. And this is dangerous and this is bad. And a lot of that's well intended and sometimes there's a grain of truth, but it can get you way in your mind and very disconnected from your own motivations and your sense of fun. I mean, that's not what the way, I mean, imagine how, how freely kids would move if we told them that's not safe, this isn't safe, which actually we're starting we to do now. And it's really <laughs> inhibiting. And now it's starting to inhibit a yeah. lot of the natural fun movements that keep them healthy. Yeah, yeah. And what's the overarching emotion there? It would be fear. It'd be fear of yeah, getting injured. Fear. Yeah. Yeah. Fear, fear of going off the edge or fearing not being able to recover or yeah, injury being the biggest one or being in pain, like knees over toes, for example, in yoga. It's like, really? Like my knee can go over my toe. It's not gonna really cause me that many problems. Is is it there's a there's a guy on Instagram, I don't even know him, he's called knees over toes guy. That's his handle. It's phenomenal. And he's I just, just heard about this guy. I just heard about this guy uh, just yesterday for some reason. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's just about that myth because this is like one of the primary exercises he does every day. And he's got his knees over his toes, like in some crazy positions. But what, what would you say to people that let's say there's no wrong way to move? Oh, well, I don't agree with that. I think that's a little bit too much in, in the other direction. There's wrong ways to move. I mean, we don't run on our hands. We run on our feet, right? If you're anyone who's running on their hands, that's the wrong, the wrong yeah. way to move. I guess the, I was thinking about this and I, and I, yeah. I thought I'd ask you because of course there is and, and just read your book to understand what the best ways to move are. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it, it's the intention is that just move your body in very different ways and that will be healthy. And, and, you know, steer away from the rep repetitive movements. Yeah, yeah, I, I, we've discounted, uh, we've underrated variability in movement. We've overrated the movement being correct and falling, you know, and looking like the textbook and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, it remains true that there are ways of moving that can get you hurt, uh, especially when there's a lot of speed and dynamism and load uh, going on. But if you're just kind of like sitting around, if, you, if you're hanging out, you're doing low load movements you do all day long. A lot of people have gotten the idea that they never want to ever be in uh, a slump or they have to spend all of their time like this. You know, that, that's overprotective. That's, a, that's an unhealthy idea to have. But we, do, but we can get hurt and some fears of getting hurt are reasonable and we need to realize that not everything's safe to do. <laughs> I mean, it's not safe for me to go to go at it at CrossFit really hard without my body being prepared. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lead them with the head again. Yeah, that's that's awesome. It's perfect. Um, so what are some of the practices you have in your daily routines or that you kind of like to explore? Yeah, I, I kind of go, uh, what I like to do is shift up my routine every month or so. So I'll say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to do, I like barbell training. It's fun. I'm going to do some barbell training. Uh, and then maybe I'll do some machine-based training. And then maybe I'll do some kind of play-based, ground-based, kind of natural movement kinds of stuff. Uh, I do, running is always part of my training a little bit. Now, sometimes that's more, sometimes that's less. Sometimes my resistance training is more or less. I'm always kind of specifically training for the sports that I like to play which are uh, squash and golf and soccer. Uh, maybe sometimes they'll have a specific goal with running a 5K or something like that. So for me, it's kind of, uh, I guess I kind of set these one or two month goals and that keeps me kind of interested. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm feeling good, feeling young. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, where do you see like the natural movement, movement going or 
because it's kind of it's got more popular, hasn't it, in the last and then five five years? Where do you see that? See that hanging around or shifting? Is it a, like a lot of people? It's it's almost like borderline fad or like it's. I think for me personally, it's serving humans and to understand how we're moving naturally. I guess with everything, we do push it to the extreme, and then it becomes kind of you know, separate to what it actually intended yeah. on being. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like uh, natural movements for sure. Uh, I, that's a good question about where is it going? I guess what one thing that, that would be good is that uh, if you there could be uh, kind of communities and tribes of people that are supporting each other in their uh, movement practices. Like my friend Rafe, you, you just mentioned Rafe, he was doing this, um, he, he did a lot of parkour, and there was this really defined, nice parkour community. He, he had a he had a gym. You know, you can gather with other people that do parkour. And he's like, you know, I want to make this more natural. I'm going to do it in the trees. So he starts like climbing trees and doing kind of this weird hybrid of parkour uh, and tree climbing, which was just perfect for him. And it would fit his his interest in doing things that are natural. And there's more benefit in in his view. And, and I think it's a good view than doing the more structured types of of activities but he's kind of the only guy out there doing it you know mm. and so he doesn't have the tribe he doesn't have the social community so he's kind of recruiting people to kind of join me in the trees and let's all kind of do this thing mm. and anytime you've got a tribe or a community there needs to be some sort of kind of structure or organization that that keeps it together uh but that goes against the grain a little bit of like this kind of like you know, of like this hippie individualistic, you know, outdoorsy natural type of people that don't like structure as much. So can you find enough structure to keep these tribes together while keeping it free and creative at the same time? Maybe that's the question for me with the natural movement community. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I was, yeah, I was on his YouTube. And I was like, how has he only got 7,000 subscribers and 70 oh he's got he's got some people listening to him online and he's got people joining him in the trees for sure yeah yeah he has i just think that's quite small for what he's doing because he's quite out there and it's quite unique and he talks so much sense in a very like grounded digestible way it's i don't know i, I love the guy i've been trying to get him on actually maybe you could sort that out <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah aside from the movement stuff what else in like the in, in health do you do you kind of advocate and anything you want to throw in here to kind of, you know, community is obviously huge. Yeah. General health. I mean, just kind of the, your, your common sense stuff. I mean, there's, there's probably like four or five things that everyone can do to improve their general health, you know, eat better, sleep better, reduce unnecessary kinds of emotional stress and, um, you know, which you can do through maybe mindfulness practices and body mind practices Get in your exercise, which to me is, you know, the aerobic, the resistance, the mobility, and the, and the functional patterns and the coordination. Uh, don't do drugs like smoking <laughs> and other <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, those are like your big, obvious, you know, low-hanging fruit types of general health stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and, and as far as how to do those things, there's different opinions. But, you know, to me, I'm kind of a moderate, middle-of-the-road type of person. I like the evolutionary perspectives but not like the paleo trendy excesses that you see in the community yeah nice good <laughs> i love it and any any advice for anyone kind of lacking motivation you, know, you mentioned earlier like getting curious is that the kind of the way in you think yeah find your motive i mean everyone's motivated to do something I mean, not everyone is really motivated to do something physical but i mean i really ask my clients when they come in it, I mean, every one of my clients, if they have pain, their motivation is, let, I, I want to get out of this pain. Of course, that's your, your, everyone definitely has that as a minimum. No one wants to be in pain. But I want them to have a functional motivation. And almost everyone can find it. You know, and, and it's some people, it's like, man, I want to get back to running. Man, I want to get back to weightlifting. That was like a part of who I am. I want It's dancing or it's walking. I mean, it's the rare person that doesn't have any motivation to do something physical. Yeah. And it, I think if you kind of search your, if you're having trouble finding it, if you search your mind, you will find it and then start going after that thing. Uh, I mean, just, just any kind of movement is, is better than sitting around. It's, it, it's so much better. I think people kind of, sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good. What demotivates them is 
oh, I, I know I don't want to go lift heavy weights and I know I won't be buff. And they don't, they don't realize how beneficial it would be for them to walk, you know, two or three miles a day, as opposed to zero or one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think walk, walking is so fundamental to our species going back to full circle. Like the best walking, exercise. Five miles a day or something, I think was, was on average how much we walked. And that's, that's really all you need. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, I, it very walk, extremely underrated the walking, especially outdoors with friends. Yeah, do what you love with people you love. I think that's 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 my uh, takeaway. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, anywhere you want to point people to, obviously your books. Maybe, maybe talk about just quickly before you go the uh, the the new book and when it's. When oh it's yeah, out. yeah. So you can you can find me on Twitter. I'm uh, just Todd Hargrove on Twitter. You can I've got a website called bettermovement.org. Got a couple books, Playing with Movement and Guide to Better Movement. Those are on Amazon. I'm writing a third book. This will be about kind of natural movement. So there'll be like a section on crawling, one on sitting on the floor, one on hanging and swinging and stuff like that. And it'll, it'll kind of talk about how our species evolved the ability to do these different movements and what are some good ideas for trying them out in, in your life. Uh, hopefully I'll get that done, uh, by, by the end of the year, but that actually that won't happen, but it might be close to the end of the year. Ever the optimistic. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mate. Well, yeah. Appreciate your time and yeah, yeah, yeah. All you're doing, man. It's, it's awesome. I think our, our culture needs it. It needs these kind of, yeah, these insights into what is more natural for us. And that's, that's the underlying theme of, of the podcast and my mission and vision. So yeah. Love it. Excellent. Mate. Hope we can stay in touch and get you back on. Yeah. Uh, well done. Thanks for having me. Best of luck.